Presented by Caltech. Okay, so let's start talking about interference. And on Friday, I'll talk about different. Um, I'm a little sleepy today, but Friday to talk about polarization in a lot of detail. Okay, and there's one question on your homework on polarization. So if you're bothered about that, please wait till Friday. We talk about that in detail in class with examples, with whole derivation and stuff. But today I don't want to break the flow and talk about interference as a continuation uh, from last week. Okay. So remember how I have a tiny room? Those of you who used to come back in the day, like first weeks, I have a pretty tiny room as a class. I'm a poor person, right? So my room has this wall, which is not too big. This looks bigger than it is. But there's a wall, okay? And I have one speaker, which is monochromatic. It emits sound only at one frequency or one wavelength, okay, just one. And I place that speaker, this is a speaker, at a distance D from the wall. And I am used to a certain pattern of music, a pattern of like sound in my room. Now, what do you expect happens? If I'm at a certain point P, let's say, in the room, what do you think? Do I hear the same frequency of sound everywhere in the room? Or is it going to be different depending on where I am? Different. And why is that? It spreads out. So let's see. From the source, let me get a point source. I like points. Let's call this a point source. It's the speaker source S, it emits spherical wavefront, for example, it's a point source. That's the wavefront nature of the, of, the, of the radiation of sound. It's propagating perpendicular to the wavefronts. And it has a frequency or a wavelength that's called the wavelength lambda. So first of all, the wavelength is not changing. Whatever point I might want to choose, lambda is fixed. Okay? So I always get the same sound from the speaker directly. It's only one frequency, one wavelength. Okay? But it does matter where I am for two reasons. Reason number one, the more trivial one, is that the amplitude of the sound falls down with distance. So it becomes you know, less loud as I go further away from it. The other more interesting thing is that, depending on where I am, sound from the speaker directly to me and something bouncing off the wall can interfere. The wall is a, is a medium of hard impedance. It has like infinite impedance. It reflects everything which comes into it. There is no absorption, you know, ideal walls. And it reflects everything off. So I have one piece of radiation, or like one wave, directly from S to P. Okay. And I can also have a ray which travels through the wall, gets reflected, and then goes to the point. And these two rays could interfere. So depending on where I am in the room, the interference pattern is pretty interesting in certain sense. Okay. So let's call this distance from the speaker to the point P as R1. Okay. Let's call the distance from the speaker to this reflected ray to the wall as, um, as D1, this line here, and D2 as the line from the wall's reflection point, let's call that maybe, I don't know, um, R. And from R to P, that's D2. Okay. So what's the total phase difference that I, as an observer, at the point P, feel because of these two waves? My net phase difference, phi. What's phi? It's, if, you have, if you add up two waves, it's the phase that wave one has minus the phase of the second wave. Okay? So how much extra phase is ray two traveling compared to ray one? Phase differences have two components to it. The wave number and the path distance. Okay? So phi is k times delta r the wave number times delta r, just like what enters the exponential, like e to the i k r, that's the phase. So that's 2 pi over lambda, that's k. What's my path difference in these two rays? 
this one goes R1, how much is this travel? D1 plus D2. You all see that? Okay. So my net path difference is D1 plus D2 minus R1. Okay. So let, let me just call R2 as D1 plus D2. That's the net path of the second ray, which bounces off the wall. And therefore, my, my phase difference is 2 pi over lambda, R2 minus R1. Is that it? Or is there something else? Now, one might argue that depending on whether this phase is the multiple of 2 pi, it's a maxima. If it's 2n minus 1 pi, it's a minima, and so on and so forth. So depending on where I am, I could hear different intensity of the sound because of the difference. But is this the final phase difference? Is there anything else happening? Is there no more phase shift? There is a phase shift. Excellent. When the ray reflects off the wall, the wall is a medium of hard impedance. And that adds a phase of pi. Okay? So my net phase difference is the, is the optical path, which is the, the real path times k, plus whatever phases shift because of you know, reflections and stuff. So this whole thing is going to be pi plus 2 pi over lambda r2 minus r1. Okay. And then this whole phase difference, if it's a multiple of 2 pi, it's a constructive interference point, therefore it's a maxima there. If it's 2n minus 1 pi, it's a, it's a minima for n equals 1, 2, So when you write down the, the interference pattern, just look for the phase differences composed of two basic ideas, the path difference with the wave number. Now had this, had I been living in water, this would be the wavelength of sound in water. Okay? So whatever enters the k here, the 2 pi over lambda is the wavelength in that medium. And remember, even though that the, that the frequency of the sound is medium independent, it's medium dependent. Sorry, what I'm saying. The frequency of the sound is source dependent. The wavelength is medium dependent. Okay? So it depends on what medium you're traveling in. In air, it has some wavelength lambda, water, different change, and so on and so forth. So that's my net phase difference. And depending on where I am, what R2 and R1 are, what point I choose, I hear some beat like pattern as I move across the road. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Now, I got a postdoc. Okay. I became rich. I literally did get a postdoc at Caltech. I'm going to be staying here for my two years after I graduate next year. So that's a good thing. So now that I got a postdoc, I want a larger room. So I tear down this wall. <laughs> the wall goes away. But I am so used to that pattern in my room that I want to reconstruct it. Okay. I am so used to like having like walking around looking for that same sound pattern that I want to have that same pattern without the wall. So I go buy another speaker of the same frequency. What do I do with it? So as to I have the same pattern of interference in my room. Let's draw it again. So this is the point S, the source. This is the point P. This was where the wall used to be, for example. Where do I place that other speaker such that I have the same interference path? Excellent. So what I could do is I could just reflect out below the wall what the distance D used to be and keep the other speaker as prime at distance D where I remove the wall. And once that happens, all these reflections by the wall, this is, this is where the wall was, this point R, it's all following laws of reflection, right? It comes in, it reflects some angle, some angle here. It's simple geometry that this distance, if you kind of get it down, it has that same distance D1, which it travels X extra, that's D1, and then that's D2 again, and that's, the, that's R1, D1, D2, that's point B, and the same pattern. <coughs> so reflecting that, that sound point below should do the trick. Or am I missing something? What about pi? So this reflection of the wall did get me the same path to But I also
also was the extreme difference of pi because of the wall's reflection. But now there is no wall. So what I do is I just have a phase shift to my speaker S prime. I delay it a little bit by half a cycle. Okay? If I delay this other speaker by half a cycle, so delay by pi, by hand, like I tune the speaker in that way. So therefore, my net phase difference is again 2 pi over lambda, r2 minus r1, the same path difference between the two points, plus pi now because of adding this delay by hand to the second speech. Okay? And this looks a lot like the Young's double split. There are two points, it has some pattern somewhere. These are first point sources, it's a little more complicated, but the point being, that's the net path difference, extra phase, phase difference. If it's 2n pi, it's maximum 2n minus 1 pi. Okay? Does that make sense? Simple example. Any questions about that? Yes. Er, can you like just move the speaker like depending on the wavelength, like a pi wavelength away, and then it'll change the interference pattern for like everywhere else, but at that one point p, mm -hmm. with that those two like rays, will those be? Uh, will that be the same? So when you say to change the, the delay by pi, it's not changing the wavelength, changing the phase of the speaker. Whatever the wavelength might be, you're just shifting it by half a cycle. Okay. So if my speaker's um, the oscillations look like that, for example, what I'm doing is with the S, this S is S prime now, it'll just like start half a cycle later. So half a cycle for this is here. So it starts at the bottom and then so that's like the difference of five. Is that what you're asking? Could you like just move the speaker like if you wanted to start them at the same time? Then you just move the speaker like, like as a function of time? Just like like physically. You move uh, it a little bit further away. So that your D1 plus D2 and then Yes, you, you could do that. But that would be tuned for that particular point, right? Mm -hmm. But if I want the same pattern everywhere, then that can just change the speaker by itself. You get the point? Right? Exactly. Yes. How do you know you're delaying it by pi? Because I knew that when I had the wall, the phase shift that I had to account for was for pi. Is that just like a given or? Because when I reflect off a hard wall, remember if you have a string, you hit it to a like, hard wall, the, the string reflects and the wave pulse flips. Yeah. And that negative sign is a phase shift of pi because e to the minus i pi is minus one. Uh -huh. Right? E to the i pi is minus one. So if you're shifting by a phase shift of pi, you're flipping the sign. And when you're reflecting off a hard wall, you are flipping the sign off the wave because of the hard wall reflection, and that's why the pi is here. And if, if I have no wall, I can mimic that same effect by having a phase delay. Okay. Does that make sense? It's a silly example I know, but this will like be used in one of other examples talking about the LiDAR, which is light. Uh, imaging and detection. We like, talk about how phase arrays could be used to point beams in one direction. Okay. But does this make sense? Okay. That's it. Just a warm up. So let's talk about this other example. This famous setup called the Newton's rings. So I think Isaac Newton back in the day. He was a curious person. He had a bunch of optical elements like a lens, a mirror, and so on and so forth. And he was playing with it. Okay? And the setup looks like this. He has a planar convex lens. So it has a lens like that. And he places that lens on a glass surface. Okay? So this is a glass surface, a plain glass surface. This is the planar convex lens. And then, if you shine light on top of it, and let it reflect and do a bunch of stuff, if you look at the pattern, the pattern that you observe looks like an interference pattern. Okay. So what's the basic idea? I send some light in, okay. some light or some wave that goes in. Some of it ref goes through, so this goes here. Okay. Now, some of it reflects back the, the bottom of the lens. It's, a, it's an interface from, from glass to air. 
right? The, even the lens is glass, right? So this is also glass. This is glass and this is air outside. So it goes from glass to air. It passes through. Some of it reflects back at that boundary. There's some reflection out here. Some of it goes through. Okay. So let me, some of it goes through and now reflects off the glass boundary of the, of the planar glass. Okay. And then reflects back here. So look at ray one from the reflection of the of the lens. That's my ray one, and ray two is the one which goes through the lens and gets reflected off the bottom glass. That's ray two. Do we expect one and two to interfere or not? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Like, does a little bit get reflected down to the glass from ray one? See, a lot is happening here. Everything reflects, everything lets through. Okay? Let me draw this way. If this is my lens, if I have, and this is my glass surface, light ray which comes in, okay, it hits the air to the glass boundary, something reflects, something goes through. Okay? Something goes through, but something also went back. But this ray is common to every other ray. Mm -hmm. Okay? It, exactly. It doesn't really make a difference because the actual thing which makes a difference is the extra path between successive reflections of different boundaries. Okay? So what goes through hits the, hits the lower boundary of the lens. Some of it gets reflected. That's our ray one. <laughs> Some of it passes through, goes down. That has an additional path that it goes in the air then reflects back, so it travels extra in the air, and then reflects back out, and that's our difference. Yes? Question? Um, how come it doesn't reflect at an angle? I'm just sending it almost perpendicular to my surfaces. But like, given that the lens is curved, like, if it were like a mirror, wouldn't it? Good, so I'm assuming the fact that um, my radius of curvature of the lens is pretty big. Okay. I'm going to use that as in my, in my calculations. So I'm assuming that the radius of curvature, that this r for the lens, is, is much larger than this distance here. Okay. In that case, it's almost perpendicular. Yeah. That's my setup. Okay. So I'm looking at the interface between ray 1 and ray 2. Okay. So let's try and characterize this setup in a little more detail. So again, that, that's my lens. That's my glass surface. Let's look at a distance d between the lens and the lower uh, glass plate. And this distance d corresponds to a distance r from the center line of the lens. This is just geometry right now, okay? So this is distance r, that's distance d, and of course d depends on r. And the radius of curvature of my, of my full lens from wherever I am, this thing here is, is R. This thing here is R. Okay. Can we connect D as a function of R? Position R. Can I find how much extra distance like ray 2 would have to travel in air as a function of where it hits the glass surface of the, of the lens? Okay. So I want to find this. I have a simple geometrical setup. This distance is little r, little d. This whole thing is capital R. Okay. So in, um, let's see, which triangle should I use? Thoughts? I have r, d, r, and <coughs> I should see this. I'm sorry, I haven't like stepped very well last night, so it's gonna be a tough day. Um, wait, draw draw a radius from like the top point right. to, the, to the point Thank with you. R and D, and then is that good? Yeah. Okay, and then when I have R here, then you can solve for the height of that triangle. Um, this one here. Yeah. 
Excellent, okay, I got it, yeah, thank you. So this distance is R minus D. Okay. And then therefore in this right angle triangle, I have R minus D whole squared, it's the, it's the perpendicular squared plus the base squared equals hypotenuse squared, which is capital R. So therefore I have r squared plus d squared minus 2dr plus little r squared equals capital R squared. Okay, capital R squared cancels off. And therefore I have r squared equals d squared minus 2dr cancel off. This should not be that hard for me. Okay, minus 2 dr, this goes away. r squared equals, oh, I see what you're saying. Thank you. Plus 2 dr minus d squared, and therefore uh, d squared is, d squared is r squared plus, no. Minus r squared. whereby my radius of curvature, capital R, is much, much larger than either R or the D. Okay. It's a large plane of convex lens. And when I have that, I could neglect D squared. It's second order. Okay. I'm only looking for changes to first order in my variables. Okay. And therefore, I have R squared equals 2D capital R, or little r equals square root. So depending on what distance you have, I've connected at what point that distance would be to a linear order. Is that okay with everyone? I'm sorry about that. I have a person. Yeah. Is that okay? We all see it? Okay. So I have two rays, ray one reflecting off the lower part of the glass, of the, of the lens. Ray two goes through, reflects off the, of the lower glass surface. And the distance it travels extra in air, I have a relationship for that D with where I am. Okay, sorry, I should not have put this R here. This R could still be decently large, right? Capital R is just much, much more than this distance D that I have in the air part. So the lens part has this distance D, and that's what is much smaller than capital R, and because of which I can have the D squared, but keep the R squared. Okay, thank you. All right, so I had notes, I could have just like looked at them, but I did not just do that. Exactly what I had here. Okay, so what's my net phase difference? Phi. 
between ray 2 and ray 1. <clears throat> How much extra is ray 2 traveling in the airport? It goes down, D, reflects on them, D again. Okay? And then the path is common. Then it has the same path up from there. Okay? So my phase difference has a part of K, that's 2 pi over lambda. Which lambda is this? Is this the wavelength of light in glass or in air? In air, because that difference of path is in the air. Okay? This is 2 pi over lambda air times the path difference, which is 2D, D down and D up. Okay? Anything else? The second ray, what is it reflecting off of? Glass. And from an air to a glass interface. So given from a rarer to a denser medium reflecting back after that. So it gains a phase of color. This is because of reflection of ray 2 of the, the glass surface. OK? Do we all see that? Right? So what's phi? So phi is 2 pi over lambda. I'm going to be calling lambda air as just lambda now. And then I have 2d. I know what d looks like in terms of little r. Okay? So d is twice d. So d is little r squared over 2 capital R okay? plus phi from my perception of the, of the plane glass surface. The 2 goes away. This is. Um, 2 r squared over lambda capital R plus 1 times pi. That's my net phase difference between the two rays as a function of little r. At what point I'm observing the interference pattern? Okay? What about this? This is, when is it a maximum? It's a multiple of 2 pi. So when it's 2 and pi, it's a maximum for n equals 1, 2, so on and so forth. And it's, and it's 2 n minus 1 pi. It's a minimum for n equals 1, 2, so on and so forth. Okay? Yes? So the maximum then refer to like reflection of the light disruptive? Exactly. Yes. Yes, they do. Yeah. So when the this phase is 2 and pi, the, the two light rays superpose constructively, and there's a maximum at that interference. If that distance further away in R has 2n minus 1 pi, then it destructively interferes. Okay? So let's find out my radii as I go away from my center at which I have maximas and where I have minimas. So maximas happen when this condition is 2n pi. Okay? So what do I get? I get pi goes off, I have 2n minus 1 times lambda r over 2 square root. Okay? At those r's from n, n equals 1, 2, and so on and so forth, at these radii along my, along my lens, I see maximum interference, like maximum constructive interference. This is where I have my maximum intensity. Okay? And what about my minimums? I can solve from here. This is plus pi. Uh, there's a minus pi, that gives a 2 pi, so there's some integer 2 m pi. So this is, um, our min is 2, pi goes away, 2 m, lambda r over 2, yeah, square root, okay, for some m. Do we all see that? Actually, there's a little mistake here. So look at this, when I move this, thing with the minimum condition, let me just make this uh, explicit, this is a little word there, but the minimum condition is, um, so it's 2 r min squared <coughs> lambda r minus pi plus pi equals 2 n minus 1 pi, that's my minimum condition. This tells me that um, 2 r min squared over lambda r equals 2n plus 2. 
Okay. Is that right? To n minus two. Okay. And n goes from <coughs> one to one. Let me just use that. So I get our min is n minus one times lambda r squared. Root. Okay. At these values of n's from n equals one to so on and so forth, I get the minimum. Okay. What do you notice? That at little r equals zero, when n equals one, my first dark fringe, my first destructive interference pattern, n equals one, r min is zero. So the way the pattern looks like this is there's a dark spot at the center. I don't know if you call it dark or light, but that's the dark. There is a light spot around it from the next R max. That's the that's light spot. Then there is a dark <coughs> spot again, and then there's a light spot, and so on and so forth. Okay. And notice that at the center I have a dark fringe. The waves are destructively interfering. Even though at the center point there was no path difference. The two waves had the same traversing path because D was zero as I went to the center. But that additional difference of pi reflection makes it a dark fringe at the center point. Okay. So just by measuring these distance between the two rings, like how, how much further these rings are, I could find out R min, R max, subtract them off or whatever, and find the wavelength of light. And in like a typical physics undergrad experiment, people do this. They go out, they put a lens, put a, put a glass plate, start observing it, find the distance between R min and R max, and from there measure the wavelength of light. Do we all think this setup? Does it make sense? Any questions about this? I know I had like royally mess up things today. So that's fine. So I won't get time to like cover everything, but let's go a little slower. Let's talk about questions, topics that like bother you about this stuff. Any questions about this? Yes. Anything else? Yes. Can you like briefly re-explain the minimum conditions? Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, those are my conditions at which I get maximum mm -hmm. minimums, right? Yeah. I'm just solving for the case where I get the minimums. I want to find those r's, those little r's, those radial distances in my pattern, such that I see a dark fringe. Okay, so I'm just solving for the condition two r square over lambda capital r plus one pi equals two n minus one pi. Okay, when I solve for it, this is the minimum condition. That's the that's the left hand side equal the right hand side. I just move the pi here. That becomes 2n plus 2, the pi is cancelled off. So I have a 2n uh, minus 2 there. And then I just move things around. And it's like, yeah. yes, um, so you said that like the, the phase difference that accounts for the reflection off the glass plate is pi. Mm -hmm. And then I'm kind of wondering like why is that? Because we said it was pi for like a hard wall, which makes sense, but like wouldn't it also like go through the glass plate? It, there would be some um, um, so what is the reflection always going to be pi no matter what the Good, excellent question. So look at that. Remember the reflection coefficient? Um, reflection coefficient from your boundary condition ideas. Um, it was z1 minus z2 over z1 plus z2. Okay. And the idea was that the reflected wave, so psi reflected, was this reflection coefficient times psi if I'm going from medium of lower to a higher impedance, which is what I'm doing here, I'm going from air to glass. So therefore, I could call this Z air minus Z glass over Z air plus Z glass. Okay? So now I have that Z glass is more than Z air. Because of which my reflection coefficient is if it's negative, that negative sign is, is, is what corresponds to 
is what corresponds to e to the i pi, which is not this one. So if you were going from glass to air instead? There would be no phase shift. There'd be no phase, There'd be no phase shift. shift. Only when you hit a boundary of higher impedance is when the phase shifts, it shifts by a factor of pi. There is still some transmission. The like transmission coefficient is still non-zero. Right? This is still non-zero, but whatever the detection coefficient is, it's negative. And that negative is what flips it out. It might be smaller in amplitude, but still flips it. Okay? That's what the flip is accounted for at the detection. Okay? Then how do we write constant in the glass and then passes through the glass to the and then comes back up? Does that really shift over at all? I just do this for sake of clarity. Honestly, there, when you observe, there's at least like some oblique pattern that you send the light in, there'll be light coming in, refraction going through, and so on and so forth. As a very simple exposition, you just like treat these light rays to be perpendicular. And just like seeing it out, clearly I made them out and so separate it. But there's a plane wave coming in, right? So everything comes in, there's a bunch of detections, a bunch of things happening, and there's a pattern that you see on top because of that. So this is just like one light ray, what it, it's doing. There's a whole bunch of mess going on. And all of its pattern still looks pretty similar to this one. Yeah. Yes? Um, the wavelength, is it um, the wavelength in the air? Or the wavelength in the uh, This is wavelength in air. This is lambda air. Because the path the difference that it's traveling additionally, it's in air. I just dropped the air for, for being brave, but it's in air, right? Now, have you ever noticed that if, um, let's say, if you're walking on the road on a rainy day like this, if there's some oil on, on, on water, you see a bunch of these colors that you can like notice. Have you all seen that? So this thing is a manifestation of that, in a certain sense. This is called thin film interference. What happens is that if there is a layer of oil where the air was, the lambda becomes lambda of in, in oil, okay? And oil is a dispersive medium. We talk about this next week in more detail, but the idea of dispersion means that different wavelengths travel at different speeds. Out here, my wave speed was just V. It's like one wave speed. But there could be media which are dispersive. And therefore, depending on what wavelength it has, has a different speed in that medium. And because of that oil layer on top of the water, different wavelengths are doing a bunch of different things. And when they interfere, they show this beautiful pattern of colors. Okay? So even that kind of like stuff is a manifestation of thin film interference. And Newton's rings is a very simple example that I have just an incoming light ray of some wavelength lambda air. It changes in glass, of course, but the path difference is, is, is in the air, and hence I have lambda air. Any other questions about this? Yes? Does it matter what's under the glass? Um, somewhat, yes, because it could go through and other stuff could happen. What people usually do is that they would kind of coat it with some absorbing material. So whatever like, goes through gets absorbed, and there's no other reflection from the bottom path. Yeah. But there could be some interference with it as well. Yes. How would it change if it was just like the floor? Like, why does it need? Um, because if it's still a high phase shift, like, isn't it similar to when we have the speaker? Yes, it, it could be the floor. <laughs> but the thing is that floors usually are very absorptive, absorptive as well. Okay. Like floors can absorb radiation a lot. But glasses and mirrors are thought to be more reflective than, than the floor material. So when I, in my room, I set an ideal wall so it was like non lossy and things like that. So you could do it, but there'll be lost from. And again, this is a very simplistic picture, like a bunch of rays are going through, a bunch of stuff is happening. But the easiest pattern I'm going to think about is one ray goes through, reflects off the, off the lens, additional path in the air, that interferes. Okay. Any other questions about this? All with me? Probably not today, but that's fine. Okay. All right. So let's talk about another example, and maybe call it a day there. So. I want to talk about something called the LIDAR. It stands for Light Imaging, uh, Light Detection and Ranging. Light detection. 
function idea is that these lidars, they shine light onto a target, and then they look at the reflection of the target to map the topology of the target. Okay? And surveyors use this to map the surface of the Earth, to map the ocean floor, to even map features on the moon sometimes. It, it's pretty interesting that they send off a light beam in that direction onto the target. It reflects back. You have a receiver. You see how much time it took, what all stuff it did. And you can reconstruct what the, uh, what the surface looks like. Okay. So a simple example of a LiDAR, what one could do is you want a beam in a particular direction. Okay. So they have a bunch of light sources, monochromatic, like lasers. So then you have a bunch of lasers. That's, that's a laser. That's another one. A bunch of lasers all lined up. Just keep on looking at that. Distance between lasers is little d. Each of them is emitting a spherical wavefront. Okay? Everything just sends light everywhere. At some wavelength lambda. Okay? So wavelength lambda. But I have my target in a certain direction where I want to point, point my beam in. Okay? So if I want to point my radiation from all these lasers in one direction. That's called the direction theta this way. So I want all my light to go towards the angle theta. Okay. Even though the wave fronts of each of them are spherical, I want maximum emission in the direction of the angle theta. Okay. So what you do is, you take all these lasers and you connect them with a wave generator, the one which generates the waves from each light source. So you have a wave generator, And every laser is connected back to it, like that, like that, like that, and so on and so forth. Okay. And what you do is, you introduce a phase shift between successive lasers. So the first one has, of course, no phase difference. The second one has a phase shift of, let's say, delta phi from the first one. The third one has a phase shift of 2 delta phi from the first one, and so on and so forth. So you're delaying every laser by a certain phase shift by uh, delta phi. So delta phi in the first one, then on the second one, delta phi, delta phi, delta phi, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now the question is, what should delta phi be from your wave generator, such that I get maximum transmission, or maximum beam-like um, propagation in the direction of theta? I'm emitting spherical wavefronts, but I want the fact that these wavefronts should all constructively interfere in the direction of the angle theta. Okay, so this will be a beam pulse. This will be a beam pulse in direction theta if they all constructively interfere in that direction. And how would that happen? Laser 2, compared to laser 1, has an extra path that the light must travel, or vice versa. Laser 1 travels this additional path of, of this distance out here, okay, compared to the laser 2. So they're already out of phase in a certain sense. They don't have, they're not like phase locked, okay. So what's the extra distance that like laser one had to travel? If this is d, this is theta, d sine theta. Okay. So the extra path that laser one travels compared to laser two is, is d sine theta. Similarly, laser two has additional path of d sine theta compared to laser three, and so on and so forth. Okay. So my phase differences between successive lasers is 2 pi over lambda times the, the path difference, d sine theta. That. So therefore, successive lasers are not really in phase. And that can be cancelled off by the wave generator phase. If this delta phi that the wave generator is like inputting to kind of offset these lasers 
if it offsets this phase shift by the, by the path difference, it will be constructed with difference. So when I have delta phi, delta phi is the phase that the generator is really kind of, you know, imposing amongst adjacent laser things. If this is 2 pi over lambda d sine theta, the net phase between the two is zero. This was traveling extra, I delayed this by delta phi, such that this was the case. More generally, even if I add some multiple of 2 and pi, that won't change anything. Because phase of something plus 2 pi is the same phase. So as long as I delay my successive lasers by this amount, there will be constructive interference in the direction theta. And around it, there will be some lower intensity. So I have a beamed pulse into the direction of my optimal target. Okay. So that condition, so this delta phi is the, is the phase lag that the generator is establishing. among successive lasers, which counteract the additional path difference that one laser has propagating related to the next. And therefore, this phase array of lasers has constructive interference in that direction. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? with me somewhat okay final thing is theta the only angle at which I have constructive interference could there be other angles at which these light sources constructively interfere by this condition of course it's at theta could there be other angles in general think about it at this angle there is some phase shift it's being matched up by the generator if I go for larger angles, I could still have constructive interference. For example, let me see what I called it here. Um, let's say that the that the next um, constructive interference happens at some angle alpha, for example. So constructive interference, interference at angle alpha, for instance. Okay. So at alpha, what do I want? I want the fact that if it's facing at direction alpha, the net phase difference from the lasers is 2 pi over lambda d sine alpha. That's the path difference with the, with the, with the 2 pi over lambda, the phase difference between the lasers from the path difference part. Okay. I have introduced delta phi from the generator. So therefore, minus delta phi, the net phase shift between these things. Whenever this is some other multiple of 2 pi. Again, this part is in direction alpha, what's the phase difference because of the path length difference? Delta phi is from the generator itself that I was imposing, such that there was a phase beamed at theta. And whenever this is the case, there would also be constructive interference at the angle alpha. And delta phi from up there, I have a, I have an answer. So this is two pi over lambda d sine alpha minus sine theta equals two and pi. Whenever this condition holds for some alpha, there would still be constructive interference. Okay. So the lidar has multiple directions where it could point the beam. And the target is in that direction that beam goes through, it reflects, can be received. You can like map the topology of that, of that whole thing. Okay. So again, I want to apologize for today. It's pretty off the rails and um, happens once in a while, I think. So let's stop here today. If there are questions, please ask me. Otherwise, we will meet on Friday and talk about polarization in a lot more detail and hopefully a lot more beam way.